I think if people knew the truth of what some of our kids were going through, they would completely get knocked off their socks. And I always say, look what they tell me. Imagine what they're not. How could they function? Because I couldn't. Many people think that the reason students aren't performing at grade level or they're dropping out or just aren't successful is because of some failure on the part of the educational institution. But it really starts before that child even steps into the school building. A lot of the educational problems are dealing with uh, youth that come from some of our nation's most difficult educational environments. One of the main determining factors in a student's success is their income level. I think the thing that we've learned in such a diverse school as ours is that poverty looks different based on where you live, maybe what your culture is. Rural poverty looks completely different than urban poverty. Poverty in Crete is the start of a new life, okay? So it's, it's tends to be, and I'm generalizing, it tends to be families that have come to Crete for a job, okay? So they, they came with very little, but they have a job, and the, the job is usually pretty hard manual labor. It looks like three, four families living in the same house. It looks like people coming into Crete with nothing but what they have on their car and having these cold winter nights than we had last month and not having not even mattresses in their homes. Saving every dime that they have to make a better life. It has different faces and it has different languages. Um, and it looked like you and me. Between 92 and 94 percent of our students live in poverty, so they live below the, the federal poverty line. That's $22,000 for a family of four. That ends up being a lot of our children who are coming from families that are really struggling to make ends meet. Poverty is a, is a significant force in our, in our decision making in Crete because we have over 45 percent of our kids that are on free and reduced lunch. We have close to 100 percent of our students on free and reduced lunch. At our school, Almost 90% of our student body is coming to us uh, considered at the poverty level. We get so caught up in race and language and this and that, but and this is just my philosophy. I think at all, the root is poverty. The assumption is, is that schools can solve all these problems on their own. Sometimes the only meal a student gets in the day is at the school building. What OPS was finding in general was that a lot of students were not eating breakfast and then midday they would have behavior issues and they would obviously be very hungry. We know that when a student comes in, they're going to have to eat because many times the night before they haven't had anything to eat. Many times over the weekend they haven't had anything to eat. I am sure that there are way more students than I would even imagine. The, their free breakfast and free lunch is maybe all they get in a complete day. Yes, we have students who come to school hungry. That's why we provide a free breakfast. Uh, and when they do come late, breakfast is typically over, so we will have something for them when they come in because we know that that will attribute to what kind of day they're going to have. Come down into our classrooms and they have about 20 to 25 minutes to eat breakfast and start their day in a calm, soothing way, much like a lot of us would at our own homes. I want to make sure that all the kids get an opportunity to eat because it is a hot meal um, and it is right around dinner time and so we never know what students are going home to. So we like to make sure that you know we err on the side of fulfilling their needs while they're in the program in case there's some need that's not being met at home. 
We have a backpack program that sends a bag of food home every Friday of the year. We are working with the food bank. Uh, they come once a week and they deliver food. And our counselor, um, through a list of families who have indicated that they have that need, uh, she provides those uh, food bags to students. She puts them in their lockers. We also provide summer uh, breakfast and lunch program because we have children who may not eat another great meal um, during the week. So all of our children are invited to come and eat breakfast and lunch all summer long, whether they're in school or not. We also have two sites that are community sites. Any kids that are in the community um, can come to and get lunch, even if they're not in summer school. And families can come at a reduced rate as well. We try to teach healthy eating habits for our children. They're not always exposed to that outside of school, so we try to expose them to healthy foods, show them easy ways to prepare it so they're not relying on anybody else to do it, and then teach them in kind of a guided process where they're able to cook their own food and then eat it. And we've also been able to give them vouchers so they can then go to the grocery stores to purchase the food items that they've practiced their cooking skills with. What we notice all, often is that students who are having a bad day, when we ask them what time they went to bed, they say, you know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, or later. When I have little ones in kindergarten who are struggling with behavior issues, one of the first questions we'll ask is, what time does he go to bed? Sometimes they're up watching TV. Sometimes they're just, they can't sleep because their their bed is in the living room because it's the fold-out couch. And if there's still something going on in the living room, they're not able to go to sleep. And for a lot of us who are raised in a middle-class background, we know that's unacceptable. You're in bed with a book at 7.30, falling asleep. Just not having the, the space and the, um, you know, we have children who sleep you know, many kids to a bed. If you have a child who is in between houses, uh, staying with mother one night, staying with grandma another night, staying with an aunt or a family member another night, uh, those kids will fall asleep in class. You're dragging yourself into school because somebody's making you do that. And unless you're going to a situation that's going to be so exciting and invigorating and keep you awake, um, the tendency is to not engage fully. So a lot of it is just awareness that we need to share with our parents that no, 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 for a five-year-old who's gonna have a very long day, this is what should be happening. Sometimes the parents didn't necessarily realize that um, our younger students should be going to bed at 7 or 8 o'clock. Even our older students, you know, as they're growing, they need much more sleep. The flip side of that is that not always are parents able to help with that. So then it forces us to think creatively. It's always been my belief that if the child needs rest, let them have that rest. Uh, I'd rather have that child close their eyes for 10, 15, 20 minutes than to have that student uh, inattentive when it comes to a math lesson or, or a reading lesson. We might have one of our first graders do nap time with Head Start so that they're able to get the rest they need and then still do their instruction in small group, whether it's with a kindergarten room or with their first grade room, to get them back on track. The 2013 urban kid needs to be fully engaged in a lesson. And when you have 42 minutes to do so, you have to be a teacher that's on their toes and creating lessons that are relevant to them. Maybe not relevant to you, but your examples um, of the concept need to relate to those kids. That's the difference between a tired kid who wants to put their head on the desk and the one who wants to engage in your lesson and learn. Access is a huge issue for our low-income students. Access not only to quality educational opportunities, but also access to quality health care. It's amazing how many students we see that are out of the classroom due to simple health reasons. If we were to call a mom and say, your little one possibly has strep, please take them to the doctor, we would then be assuming that A, they had a primary care physician, and B, they had the transportation to get there, and C, they had the language, which for a lot of our families, those three factors would limit them. And the children just wouldn't be treated and they would miss days and days of school. And it's nearly impossible to recover from that for any student, but especially those students 
at risk or already living in poverty. We have a school-based health care center so that if one of my little kindergartners is sick, instead of just going to the nurse and having to be sent home, they go to the nurse, who then refers them next door to the school-based health clinic, who's able to help them out in the time that it takes to call the parents and have the parents come up here. The school-based health centers are really there for that student to be in school and get the access and services that they need. If you were to go to your pediatrician, they have the exact same things that our clinic offers. We're able to do immunizations, we're able to do physicals, sports physicals, and entering kindergarten physicals. We're able to do a variety of tests. We have our own little lab here, so we're able to do, for example, a strep test. And really our goal with our kids is to keep them in school. The communities and schools liaison can help parents uh, get access to medical care. If a a parent is having difficulty uh, getting their child in to see a doctor or a child needs glasses or uh, the child needs to get to an appointment or something to that effect, then that liaison can uh, act as uh, the go-between between the school and the home and help that child. What's really nice about having that uh, agency within the school is that they can do some of the things that we can't do. The American school calendar and, and clock doesn't really respond to parents working calendars and clocks. And so we have large chunks of time when children aren't in school where their parents are working. The Justice Department was seeing a lot of students who were getting in trouble um, doing things that they shouldn't be doing in between the hours of like three and six. Kids getting out of school and possibly going home to a home that doesn't have an adult there to help them with homework, to talk to them about their problems, to challenge them to move forward academically. What we know about um, kids in poverty, they tend to lose a lot of, of skills over the summertime where their more affluent peers actually can gain. Well, what's the difference? You know, one side of the continuum is going on vacation. They're going to the museum. The other side of the continuum might be watching their younger siblings, you know, hanging out watching TV. They're, they're not having that um, rich experience. For those students who do not come to summer school, you can see the loss immediately. Through our data, what we were finding is when the kids leave us in May, if they are not in school with us for that three-month period, it takes us till December to get them back to where they ended in May. Now there's only 24 hours in a day, and I don't want all 24 of them, but if, if there's some open time, um, I'd just as soon have it. We have a before school program, and it'll have breakfast, and it'll be a safe place after school. You don't get home till whatever at night. Um, we'll have some activities after school, and we'll make sure that there's a snack or something to eat, and we're gonna make all of that a very educational environment. Panther Pack is an after-school enrichment and academic support program. We operate out of Morton Magnet Middle School um, from 2.40 at dismissal time until 6 o'clock. The first hour of the program is strictly homework and tutoring. Um, and then the kids will get a hot lunch right after that homework hour. Um, and then we also have enrichment activities. We bring in different providers from the community to work with the kids um, on fun activities, things that really engage the kids and make them want to come back to the program every day. Completely Kids is a program that was formerly called Campfire USA. It's funded through grants and through the Completely Kids organization, which is right up the street from us. At our school, it's an extended part of our day. So all of the programming is in line with what the students are doing during the day with us. We've done a lot of co-planning and co-teaching with the Liberty staff and the Completely Kids staff so that we're all on the same page for our children. For our summer school program, uh, everyone is eligible to come. It's open to anyone, so that, you know, roughly around 3,000 students. In Lexington right now, in our summer programs, we have about 1,200 students. Our summer school program for our elementary kids 
is heavily academic in the area of math and literacy, and the other half is um, activities and building background knowledge and experiences for kids that they normally don't have. We have our reading block in the morning, and then we have a math block, and then in the afternoon they have swimming lessons. They also have activities that are hands-on activities that tie into the um, math and literacy blocks. So if you're learning a, uh, a lesson in math, then you go to cooking and baking and you apply that directly into what you're, in, you're learning. And what we have found is the kids that now are in our summer school program are not so showing any academic slide when they come back in August. If you're a school that um, is sitting back waiting for children to come, your success will be directly in line with the number of children that are in poverty or the number of minority poverty students. You have. So there's no sense in even really doing a test because I can already tell you what your test scores are going to say. Whether it be vocabulary, whether it be um, social or emotional skills, for some reason low-income students are lacking in those areas. When a student comes to school unprepared, those students literally look like a deer in headlights because they don't know basic things. They don't know their letters. They don't know their sounds. They don't know their colors. They're typically six to 12 months behind their peers at that time, uh, and it takes them twice as long to catch up. Children were showing up for kindergarten and were on very different playing fields. We had such a variety of kids from knowing zero letters to knowing all of their letters and reading books. And we really felt like we needed to bring those skills together a little bit and level that playing field. A lot of people think that early childhood education is just dropping your child off with a friend or a neighbor, but really when we say quality early childhood education, we're talking about the additional academic supports, we're talking about social and emotional development. We have two Head Start classrooms where the children are learning to socialize with one another because many of them don't have those types of skills. And the teachers are working on those fundamental things like their alphabets, like their numbers, like their sound. As a kindergarten teacher, it makes a huge difference and I can see when they come to kindergarten those who have been in preschool and those who haven't. By being in the early childhood education program they pick up so much more in vocabulary. Their vocabulary is much more enriched. They know more school words. They know more about how to follow directions, how to raise their hand to talk to the teacher, how to make a form a line. So those are all things that are needed when they come to kindergarten just for us to be successful as kindergarten teachers and teach them what they need to know to go on to first grade. The schools that are um, overcoming some of those high risk factors are the schools that are taking control of their own destiny and saying, why would I want to miss out on a two-year-old, a three-year-old with all that sort of um, potential for learning? What early childhood does is gives these kids a foundation before they ever hit kindergarten, which gives them so much more of a chance to get through it with graduation. That I think if we aren't providing early childhood education, we've missed the boat with those kids. I came to Crete in 1989 and uh, was an assistant elementary principal and um, uh, the town was uh, pretty typical from uh, that time period for Nebraska. We had probably um, about 1% minority, uh, lots of two-parent families, uh, definitely a blue-collar town that has changed dramatically. And as a lot of communities in Nebraska are losing population, uh, we follow the trend of other communities that are gaining population are with minorities. Liberty has 60 percent uh, Latino students, uh, 50 percent of all of our students are learning English as a second language. South High School is um, a, a school of about 2,250 students. About 69 percent of our students are uh, Hispanic and um, an even breakdown of 
African American and Caucasian. And there's about 75 different languages that are spoken with the number of students who come with English as their second language. Many of our families now are coming up from Central America and many of those families are not literate. Therefore, they have no written language. They speak a dialect. And so when we say you need to read to your child at home, they can't read, definitely can't read English. Those are huge hurdles, huge obstacles that teachers have to get over before they can even just sit down and teach a lesson. I found, especially in the Latino community here in South Omaha, the language barrier is so huge. And if we can break that language barrier and they have somebody they can talk to who can teach them and, and help them understand our system, um, because the system is complicated. We found that um, the bureaucracy involved with trying to get help sometimes keeps people from asking. So we often refer to it as one-stop shopping. One of the things that we do for them, we offer citizenship classes English as a second language and transition classes, as well as preschool for their children, summer school, and many other different services that are provided through our office. And we use parent educators to visit the homes and help the parents get involved in the children's education. One of the most exciting parts, I think, with the program that we provide is that we have home visitors who go in and they work with the parents. They teach the parents how to read books to their children. And if the parents aren't able to read, they teach them how to read the pictures. Um, they also need to convince these families that it's not just the school's job to educate the children, that the parents are probably one of the most critical factors. And that is the part that we really work on, is the parent involvement in a child's education. That's, that is the thing that's going to mean success for those children. Our family room is a core element at Gomez Heritage. We have two bilingual liaisons who reach out to our parents. They provide them a comfortable, welcoming place where they can come and ask any questions on any topic. So if you have that guide who's willing to not only help the student in the classroom, but help the parent understand how public schools work, then of course they'll come in and they'll be involved in, in, in that expectation. They'll meet it. Not, not by force, but because they love their kids and they want their kids to be successful. You know, oftentimes we're judged on on the numbers, the data, the, the percentages, the graphs. And what's left out of that is the human element of what's happening to get our students to progressing in their reading levels, in their math levels, in the time it takes them to walk across that stage and graduate. Um, there's a whole lot going on with them that they bring to us that we have to deal with in order to get to the academic achievement. When we start making judgments on why someone shows up in Crete and doesn't speak English, doesn't have a job, you know, being a burden, I would just share, um, you know, what would you do with your family if, if it was so bad, so bad in another country that you're willing to walk across a desert or get crammed into a van, um, tell me what you wouldn't do for your family. It's, it's really easy for us to get off work and go straight home and not think about what happens in the community or in our schools, but that directly affects all of us. And so if we adopted more of an attitude that this is not just someone else's problem or Morton's problem or North Omaha's problem, but that this is a Nebraska issue and we're all gonna stand behind it. You know, I just encourage when people, when they hear great things happening in, in their community or their schools, share it with everybody. There's great things happening every day, everywhere. But if we don't tell other people about it, then we've done a great disservice to everyone. Go to the school in your area and volunteer. Um, they need involvement, they need fundraisers, um, they need just friendly faces in the building that are willing to come in and say good morning to a student um, who might need that when they're coming in the door. We were always taught that you're as strong as your weakest link. And we have kids that come in with many challenges and 
deficiencies that we, we have to make up. But when they leave our schools, they become part of the greater society of Nebraska. And we want all those kids to have the same opportunities and the same situations that they can be successful in because these kids are gonna go on. And so it's not gonna matter what color they are, how much money they had when they were little, um, where they came from, their background. Once they're here, they're ours. They're all Nebraskans. We don't go around and say, well, you're this kind of a Nebraskan and you're this, we're all Nebraskans. B-E-S-T. The best is what I want to be. That's what I want for my students. I want them to be the best. I want them to be the best doctor, the best lawyer, the best politician, the best teacher, the best principal, the best astronaut, the best scientist. Whatever they choose to be in this lifetime, that's what I want for them. And that's what I want for their parents. I want their parents to be able to say, my child was motivated and encouraged to go on and strive to be the best that they can be. And that's what I want for my children and my students, is to be the best that they can be.